Yeah. All right, so uh, Tim Donahue is going to start the tutorial on Angular 2 development here. So thanks, Tim. Here are links at the bottom, um, and also for our, our shared uh, Google Drive as well. There are stuff in the uh, Google Doc there as well, linked to these slides. Um, so if you wanted to follow along or look at these later, um, I'll mention uh, these slides were based off of a, a longer workshop that was done in open repositories this year uh, between myself and Art Wall at Atmire. Uh, so it's a combined effort. With this, I'm not going to go through all the ones from open repositories because there's a lot of hands-on activities at the end, but I'm going to leave that to you to go back and work through those as sort of more a hands-on experience and ask questions on Slack or mailing list um, if you get problems with that, with the hands-on aspect of things. But this is going to be a little bit more of a tutorial aspect of the workshop where with a tutorial, I'm going to teach you more about Angular, um, how it's structured, how, um, how you can change things with an Angular, and honestly, I would want you to ask questions throughout here. Please just raise hands or yell something out if I, if I don't see uh, your hand up in the air, because I think there will be questions throughout, and I'd like to be able to answer them as we go, uh, so we can kind of uh, look at code snippets as we're going through and, and kind of uh, address those questions as we are, as we're going through this. So the beginning part of this, uh, this is the tutorial schedule, so it's really kind of, I'm going to do a quick review about Angular and the architecture, which I showed yesterday at this meeting. Um, the bulk of it is going to be this middle section, Introduction to Angular, around the concepts of the code, give some code snippets, show you how this works in the DSpace realm. I'm not really going to get into the hands-on aspect because we just won't have time for that, plus uh, we'd have to go around and set up laptops and everything like that. But uh, we have a detailed uh, documentation on that. Uh, from the workshop at Open Repositories off the wiki there. Um, so you can go there and there's slides at the end here that also link to that and, and walk through a stage process of doing hands-on um, code commits and you can actually look at a GitHub code repository which has every single code commit of this hands-on aspect so you can follow that along later on um, after this session. So a uh, quick review from yesterday in case you've, uh, you went out and had a lot of fun and forgot everything. Um, which I hope you didn't. But these were our top eight, eight things for why we chose Angular after the, uh, after the um, analysis we did last year with the prototyping, the UI prototyping challenge and all of that. I'm not going to go through all these. I mentioned them yesterday, but the big ones, of course, providing that dynamic user experience, making sure we can support uh, non-JS browsers and non-JS um, Things like uh, uh, crawlers, Google Scholar crawlers. Uh, we had a lot of fun developing with this and found it to be very modular and custom customization friendly, which is what we're really going to look at a little bit more today. Um, a little bit more, though, about <coughs> Angular. When we were first doing the prototyping of Angular, it was on Angular 2.0 and alpha version. I think I mentioned this yesterday. It uh, moved into beta and actually released in late 2016. But as of now, it's up to Angular 4, I think it's 4.3, they skipped 3.0 strangely, they decided to go from 2 to 4, um, but it's all backwards compatible and the way they're doing the Angular development uh, seems to be much more controlled now in terms of making sure things are backwards compatible, that upgrades are relatively seamless. Our code base is now upgraded to the latest Angular as of at least a week or so ago, from 4.3 is what we're working off of. Um, and, it, and the 4.0 uh, model is, is, is kind of streamlined in terms of speed. And it has Universal, which is a very important plugin for our purposes, and I'll get into that, um, built into 4.0, whereas it was separate uh, in the 2.0 um, release. So what is Angular? How does it work? This is the basics, of course. So we're generating HTML via JavaScript. It's going to happen on the client side or the server side, which we'll get into. Obviously, we got data from the REST API. Tons more about that on Angular.io. They got great resources there, great tutorials. And I showed these slides yesterday, but I want to review them briefly because we're going to go through and see how this, this works a little bit more in action and how um, and what's behind this. But, um, but as I mentioned yesterday, as long as your browser supports JavaScript, this is sort of the interaction that you'll see where the first page comes back as HTML pre-compiled from the server and we get the app downloaded at the same time. The reason why it does that is quite important even for users to have JavaScript is that it provides a very quick response. It's a lot quicker than if you had to load the entire JavaScript app down first and then run the application. So the first page is already loaded while the app is continuing to download and then as you're interacting 
uh, with that first page, the app has managed to download by that point in time, you're able to interact directly with the REST API from that time forward. Um, so that's the reason behind uh, that development within Angular 2 um, and Angular 4. And as I mentioned yesterday, uh, with the JavaScript, when there's no JavaScript, you can go to the browser for, uh, for crawlers like Google Scholar, every single request is returning that HTML, that pre-compiled HTML. And this is what is actually provided by that Angular Universal plugin. I didn't mention this yesterday, but it's quite important that it's out of the box now with uh, Angular 4. And what that provides is that capability to do server-side rendering of your Angular application using the exact same code that the client is using. So they're seeing the same thing using the same code. There's not extra uh, code weight that we need to do to support Angular Universal. Uh, there is sometimes certain third-party plugins with Angular that may or may not support Angular Universal as well. So you have to be careful sometimes in selecting third-party plugins if you wanted to have that full SEO compliance. Um, it needs to be able to support the Angular Universal uh, plugin. <coughs> and these one of them. Like, have you authenticated? Yes. Does the Angular Universal also know how to simulate like? Authenticated user, yeah, or like particularly like a shibboleth authentication or something, or is it like a watered down browser? Uh, it's a little bit more though. It's really built around that uh, quick interaction for that first hit, as well as SEO compliance. And since search engines don't often log in and authenticate, um, that's a very good question. It's not going to necessarily. Uh, I mean, the code. As long as the code after you've authenticated is still compliant with uh, Angular Universal, which most of it is, unless you're using third-party plugins that don't fully support it, um, then uh, you're going to get that same experience. I will say, though, that um, our concentration in building DSpace out is to make sure the SEO compliance, even with current DSpace, we aren't really trying to provide great SEO for like the submission process or things of that nature. Um, thing this in the same way with uh, with DSpace seven, I don't anticipate us concentrating as heavily with Angular Universal in that submission process. Whereas we would concentrate extremely heavily on anything on the public page because uh, we want search engines to be able to grab everything they can from those pages. So, um, so I know that doesn't fully answer your question, but it basically means that on the third in the third party plugins that we're using. We're going to be very tight on the public plug the plugins we're using on those public pages for pagination and stuff like that. They all have to support universal, you know, to the utmost extent. Stuff on the submission process we may be a little bit less strict on because that's not doesn't need to be as SEO optimized. So that makes sense. Yeah. Um, okay, so and I mentioned this briefly that first page always renders on the server, which means that first a hit to your site, uh, you, you get a perception of a much quicker response because it's just a flat HTML page coming across rather than the full application. And those are the other sort of reasons behind um, Angular Universal. And I should mention that more and more plugins these days for Angular do support Universal, and I anticipate most of them will in the future, but there's sort of a transition period right now where people are getting more comfortable with this concept of having that pre-compiled JavaScript on the server side. And so if some plugins aren't taking that into account, uh, there can be issues there with, uh, with when you turn JavaScript off. It may not appear exactly the same. It still is usually close, but it may not be exactly the same in terms of the experience. OK, so here's where I'm going to jump. I showed the demo yesterday, but I'm actually going to show it with JavaScript turned off here now. Um, so here's our uh, demo hosted at Atmire. We've got we're in our uh, in Google Chrome. Uh, F12. What's that? Try F12. Uh, F12. Yeah. Did I bring up the developer tools. Yep, that's what I want. Okay, so in the Chrome has these nice developer tools, which if you're a developer, you've probably played with these many, many times. But the developer tools also have a lot of cool debugging capabilities for Angular, since Chrome, of course, is a Google product, and so is Angular. Um, where are your settings? Let's disable JavaScript. Go to our network tab Okay, so now if I reload. Um, on our network tab. So 
directories. So the, the document, the HTML document here is this home page. So if I click around, you'll notice in the, uh, the network side of things, we're loading entire HTML documents. They're named really oddly because we're using UUIDs here. So the UUID or the URL here, you see there's a full UUID here that we requested the entire HTML page. So we're going communities to collections. So if I want to go collection that doesn't have any con public content, let's try the demo. Uh, skip items. Okay, so we're pulling down the entire collection page. You can see over here, it's the same sort of uh, user experience that, that you're getting, but you're requesting each time the entire page. And you see all these separate requests here each time I hit the button. It's still relatively quick because this is a very small site. There's not a whole lot of content there, um, but it's all happening with JavaScript disabled. And I realized that you can't see that icon, but the JavaScript is disabled here um, uh, throughout this entire request process. If I turn JavaScript back on, you're going to see a really different um, level of requests in this uh, network council here because we're no longer having to pull down the entire document. So I'm going to put JavaScript back on. Uh, let's go back to our home page here. Um, so we're at the home page level. We've got the, we pulled down the application, and there's going to be a lot of hover over things as to what's running. But as I do uh, step down here again now from the home page, you're going to notice that I'm not getting, you're getting a lot of these client JS calls here, which is grabbing down the data that we need to go to the collections page. Um, and if I hover over here, you can see it's actually showing me, I went to the REST API here to grab down information about the collections, but I didn't pull down an entire HTML page. And the request process is quite different. So I'm not actually seeing another full request. I'm just adding little tiny requests um, to the to the uh, to the the REST API rather than actually uh, reloading the entire page, which is what makes this much much snappier um, with the JavaScript to me. So that's kind of the very gist of that, and you will be able to see that much more easily within uh, when you do uh, this sort of network view uh, within Chrome or any other browser that supports that. Are there any questions on that before we go along here? We get into code next. Oh, yes, George? Um, I noticed that when you went to a collection, the, uh, uh, normally in, in now, nowadays in DSpace, you get the handle for mm -hmm. the collection, but I wasn't seeing a handle. I was, uh, is that going to be going away? Uh, that is still under discussion how we're going to ha handle the handle. <laughs> <laughs> so the URLs, yes, as you're seeing here, oops, um, as you're seeing in the actual URLs up here, right now we're using the UUIDs right. um, based on the, the URL structure here. Uh, we'll still support, we're still supporting handles and that the handle links will be provided once you get down to the item level and they'll still do the proper redirect. But what's under discussion is whether or not um, the URL at the top here necessarily needs to have the slash handle um, in there or whether we want to make it slightly more generic and work with the UUIDs and, and allow us to support other types of identifiers so that you're not creating a slash handle URL, slash DOI URL, and all of that, but rather those would act more as redirects, which is what they are in, in any case. They're redirecting you to the proper path to where that object exists. So I will admit, I don't have an exact answer for you yet, but that's been an ongoing discussion in the DSpace 7 group. And if you have thoughts on that discussion or what you'd like to see, I would encourage you to let me know or uh, join one of our meetings or just you know, prompt me via email and I can pass it along to the DSpace 7 group if you feel that that would be a bad decision if we suddenly got rid of slash handle. Um, without, with, I mean, to clarify, we aren't getting rid of the redirect, just the visualization of how it would look in the URL. So, so if you have thoughts on that, let me know what you all think on that. Our stakeholders want human readable URLs. They want to know exactly what they're looking at. So we have um, Mark and Atmeyer put together something that we call a slug. So we actually write our own every time we do a metadata upload for every single resource we're putting in there so that when the assistant director of the Department of Labor looks at a record, she knows what it is because she can read what it is at the end. So human readables URL, human readable URLs are good, yes. Yeah, I would agree with that. That'd be a, that's useful feedback to have. And to, to explain, I don't think that this will be what the final URL structure will be in any way, because we've also been talking about the fact that this 
the UU idea is this extremely long, obscure thing at the end. We don't want it to be this extremely long, obscure thing, but we're trying to figure out a better model for uh, dealing with handles and other external identifiers um, and tra transforming them into something that isn't more of an internal D space identifier. So you can do that redirect to the proper location. But yeah, a human readable aspect of that or something that's more simplistic than a giant 16 digit or 32 digit string or however long it is, <laughs> um, so makes perfect sense. And something more automated than us, you know, handwriting every and single one by ourselves each time. And I would ask that somebody, since I don't have a notepad here, if somebody can grab, uh, either put it in the public document and note down some of these, these requests that might be useful or pass them along to me and I'll move them down. Um, afterwards, but that sounds totally reasonable to me and sounds like good feedback. Okay, so any other questions on this demo part of things real quick? Um, I'm not going to go back into the REST API demo because this, uh, this tutorial is a little bit more about the Angular side of things, but as you saw, we were doing the REST requests with when JavaScript was, was enabled, but those same requests were not there when JavaScript is enabled. Disable it because of the fact that this, it's happening on the server side. It's grabbing the data down and pre-compiling the JavaScript for us. Okay, so now we're going to get in the actual introduction to Angular and the concepts in the Angular uh, technology, the language, and all that sort of stuff. I will mention that there's really good tutorials off the Angular I/O website um, that can step through some how to work with data, how to do all this sort of stuff within an Angular. What I'm going to be talking about is a little bit more DSpace centric somewhat. So it will introduce you to the concepts behind Angular, but when we get examples, we're, we're pulling examples from our DSpace 7 code base as it currently exists um, and providing some, some structure for that. So with Angular, these are the, the topics we're going to go through here. Um, I'm going to briefly touch on Node, NPM, and Yarn, which are some new prerequisites for right now. Those may change slightly before the DSpace 7 final release, and I'll mention that in a moment why. Uh, the TypeScript language, we'll take a look at that, because uh, this is what you'd be doing the majority of your programming in when you're not writing HTML uh, at the Angular level, is TypeScript. And then we're gonna look at the main uh, elements within an Angular application. Uh, these are the four main uh, concepts within Angular. There are some other concepts that we're not gonna dig into because they're really quite advanced. Um, but uh, they're not things that we use heavily within DSpace itself right now, DSpace 7. Um, Angular has better uh, walkthroughs of the other um, couple concepts there. But these are the main four things that we're going to be dealing with, components, templates, services, and modules. So on the server side of things, uh, there are some new prerequisites for building and running the DSpace 7 application as it sits. We have, a, we have Node.js, which is the server-side um, JavaScript platform that does the compilation. Of JavaScript on that on um, the server side when we're using Angular Universal, uh, it uses NPM, which is just its way of pulling in dependencies. So it's kind of like a Maven sort of uh, thing uh, for Node and Node.js. Uh, but we're actually using a slightly uh, different version of this called Yarn, which has this cute little I can't you may not be able to tell it's a cat made out of Yarn uh, logo there uh, that is a third party package manager. That, is, that works the same as NPM, but it's actually a lot faster. It's, it's quickly becoming um, the way to do things in the JavaScript realm, and it's supported by a lot of the major players in JavaScript, uh, Facebook, Google, and Tilda, who are behind um, uh, Facebook does, um, uh, I'm just forgetting the Facebook platform, React. React. Uh, Google, of course, is Angular, and uh, Tilda supports Ember.js, so there's three main platforms in the JavaScript world and they're all using Yarn right now. And so that's why we've started to move towards, towards just using Yarn to build things um, within our application. Some of these may end up changing as we go along with DSpace 7. Uh, the main one that could possibly uh, fall out here, uh, potentially, is Node, because uh, we're using Node primarily for that server-side uh, pre-compilation in Angular Universal. The Angular Universal team is currently looking at ways to support that same level of pre-compilation in things like Java. So, um, so they're actually looking to see if they can just run Java on the server side, in which case it might just be much more like it currently is in DSpace, but the, it gets pulled in via Maven automatically. You don't really have to pay attention to the fact that it's there, and it's providing that server side compilation. Um, so we'll see how this changes over the next uh, coming months 
uh, in the final release, but these are currently our, our requirements for when you're getting up and running with the DSpace Angular application. So that's all I'm going to touch on with that. Um, TypeScript is, is the main language here that we're working with. It's an extension of the latest version of JavaScript, uh, which is the, the actual uh, standard behind it is called ES6. Um, and JavaScript right now, the standard itself is actually following the TypeScript language more and more these days, which is why we like Angular and like the TypeScript language, is that it seems to be the direction that JavaScript is going in. Um, and what that, uh, right now, these are most, uh, sorry, not DSpace, most, um, most web applications do not even support uh, the latest version, or not web applications, most web browsers do not even support the latest version of JavaScript. However, TypeScript is able to kind of compile things down to the current version that browsers support. Uh, and it allows that capability to be on the latest and greatest JavaScript without the browsers having to understand what that latest and greatest JavaScript is. Um, and so what TypeScript basically does at a basic level, it's adding types and annotations to JavaScript. It makes JavaScript look a little bit more like uh, Java or .NET. You're not dealing with bars. If you've done JavaScript programming, it's not everything's a bar or a variable and you don't know whether that's a string or an item or what it is. Um, it, they can actually be typed and that's what I'm showing down here at the bottom. Uh, we have a private variable called title and this, this title must be a string, so it's a string. This my item must be an item. There's an item object there. And if you want that any type, that, that, that sort of var functionality, you can, there's an any type as well, which means you can stick any sort of variable within that my um, uh, variable there. So it's a very type strict uh, language, and that's beneficial in IDE development. And when you're using an integrated development environment, um, it can find bugs before you would actually run the application. So as long as the IDE understands TypeScript, it can catch things before you go and try and run it and comp compile it and say, you know, this isn't a string, it's actually an item that you stuck in here. That's, that's wrong, that sort of stuff. So as I mentioned briefly, it compiles down to regular JavaScript. Uh, errors can be detected at that compile time but in the IDE. Um, compiling down to regular JavaScript is another very important aspect of TypeScript because that means if TypeScript for some reason or another goes away in six months, goes away in a year, we can compile down our entire application just to basic JavaScript and we can start developing against that basic JavaScript app if we wanted to. I don't think that will ever happen because Microsoft's behind TypeScript, Google is building Angular on TypeScript, um, we have big players that are, are following the TypeScript languages, as I mentioned, JavaScript seems to be following TypeScript as well. Um, so I doubt that that would happen, but it's a benefit here that we see out of TypeScript. Um, and there's also a lot of other concepts in terms of interfaces, um, other sort of things that are in, in, JavaScript, in TypeScript that, uh, that you'll be familiar with if you're familiar with any sort of Java programming along the way. Uh, there's more tutorials on typescriptlang.org, but we're going to see a lot more TypeScript as we go and look at actual code here. That's just the overview of what TypeScript is, uh, why, why it's important for the Angular world. Um, and here is an example, actually, of some TypeScripts. Hopefully you can see this. I'm not sure if it's going to be as easily visible or not. Um, but I've numbered some lines here. So at the top here, you can see you can do import statements uh, similar to Java. So I'm importing something that's called metadatum. That's an object from this other file. That's the metadata model file. So I can do imports into my TypeScript class. Um, I can create abstract classes. So a Java sort of concept. So I'm exporting an abstract class called DSpace object. It's going to implement something. So you can implement a different object. Uh, this is an interface, just like uh, in Java world. You've got a cacheable object interface that may define certain methods that you have to implement when you're saying I'm implementing cacheable objects. And so that, that's, that's how you would create an abstract class and implement something. This uh, class itself has a couple of variables that belong to it or a couple of properties that belong to it. So a DSpace object has a name. Uh, that's going to be a string. Uh, it also has some metadata associated with it. And that's going to be an array of metadata objects. Um, so you can get the idea. This is this is a real class in the DSpace code base. So as we all know, everything has a name in DSpace. So it's usually the title or communities and collections. They actually have a name which is stored in DC title. And they all have metadata, as we mentioned earlier today. As of DSpace 5, all these objects have metadata now. So whether you're working with a, D, uh, a collection community, whatever it is, 
They've all got metadata within them, all the DC fields. Uh, we then have a method down here that we've implemented. This is a fine metadata method. It takes in a key, which would be like a DC title, which happens to be a string. So we're taking in a key of the metadata field and an optional language. The question mark here means that you can include a language or not. If you don't, it's not going to worry about the language. If you say, I want the DC title that's in English or in Spanish, then it's going to look specifically for that. So that's also a string here. Um, and it returns a string. So the syntax here is different uh, than, than JavaScript traditionally or than Java traditionally, but it's very conceptually similar to a lot of other patterns that you'd see in either JavaScript or Java. It's just that the types here often come after the variables. If you're used to a Java way of things, you'd often have like a string key. Here you say key, key is a string. Um, so that's the find metadata method. Uh, we're defining a different uh, constant uh, named metadata here that's going to use a different object. Uh, this dot metadata is this array of metadata that we have here. And it's going to run a find on that and look for any uh, metadata field uh, where the key of that metadata field matches up with the key passed in here. And where if the, if the language is either empty if that's not there or the language matches up. So this is kind of a, a fancy way of doing this in a JavaScript sort of way, but it's just looking for that metadata field out of our array that matches up with the key that we passed in and the language we passed in. And then it just returns the value, which is a property of this metadata object. And when you're working on this in an IDE then, because TypeScript is typed, because it understands what a metadata object is and what properties there are, you're going to get things like auto-completion and stuff that are not necessarily as easily done in a JavaScript realm, but you're very familiar with within a Java sort of realm. So when you type out metadata dot, you get an auto-completion that shows you that you can add a value on that to return the value, or that you can call a method on that, or, or things of that nature based on that object's uh, description in TypeScript. So that's a very um, uh, basic sort of uh, alignment of how TypeScript looks. The syntax does take some getting used to, but it starts to become second nature after you play around with it a little bit within an IDE. Um, go ahead, Mark. So the, the rocket operator there is it finding a, an anonymous function body or something. This uh, little arrow. Uh, yeah, that is a lambda. What's it called? It's a lambda. Lambda. That's the terminology. Yes, it's a lambda function. So yes, it's basically. Uh, it, it's uh, basically doing a find, so it's finding all of the metadata objects within this array, the m here, it's a, it's a metadata that, that it assigns to the value m, and then it's going through all the, it's basically looping through this array and looking at the keys of that array and looking for a situation where the key in that array is the same as this key and it's also got a matching language. So but it's called a lambda function, um, and, and it's a concept that's uh, more familiar in like Ruby. Ruby has that as a as a concept. Um, I'm trying to get other. And it's coming to either Java. I think Pascal. Java nine. Java nine. Yeah. Scalar, Pascal. Scalar, Pascal. Yeah. So it's common in other languages as well. It's not a, um, a totally obscure concept, but it's also one that that uh, TypeScript supports because it is actually a um, available in one of the later versions of JavaScript that hasn't even come out yet. It doesn't work in browsers yet. Yeah, ES6 term for it is arrow ES6. function. Okay. If you wanted to Google that, there's some really good examples on how to use that. Okay. So then now we're gonna so then we're gonna evaluate this impromptu function and feed the results to metadata.find. Right? Correct. Yeah, okay. well yeah, it's, it's almost like a loop. It's basically kind of looping through, yeah, it's an impromptu um, uh, looping through the, the metadata array here, um, this find function and doing this match and returning the value, um, returning the first value that matches into this constant metadata here, and then returning the dot value down here. So it's kind of the conceptual idea of how that works. Um, I don't, I don't know if I know well enough how to explain it more than that conceptual idea there, but there's a lot more documentation. You have something to mention there, Tom? Yeah, so we have pattern matching. Do we have like, abstract data types? Like a, like a tree structured genome, basically? In TypeScript? Yeah. 
good question. Anyway, I'll look into it. Yes, look into that. This is that. Yes, yeah. I want to say that probably it is, but I don't know for certain. Yeah, I would Google that. I'm going to admit, first off here, um, I am coordinating this project. I'm not doing active development. So some of these questions I will probably answer a little vaguely or point you to say we need to talk to Art. Art Lowell is the one who does the lead developments um, at Atmire on, um, on the Angular application. There's others as well. Um, I know enough that I played around. I, I helped with the prototyping last year, so I did do development last year. But I'm a little bit rusty currently with my with the absolute latest uh, version of Angular 4. So some of these things um, I need to find out the answers to as well. Um, okay, so that's our base. Is there any other questions here? I guess we'll be getting into more examples of TypeScript as we go here and look at the various Angular concepts because this is the language everything is is written in. Um, essentially, anything that's that's uh, processing language, not the themes. Okay. So let's go along here. Um, so this is taken uh, directly from the architectural guide for Angular, um, and then I feel like this sentence kind of really describes these concepts really well. So you're writing an Angular application by composing HTML templates. So it's your HTML based templates. You're composing them with some angularized markup. So there's additional markup tags that you can create that are Angular specific. You're writing component classes of, that manage those templates. So there are ways of componentizing those templates. And you're going to see how that works in a moment. Um, adding application logic into services. Services are really what interacts with the REST API. So that's where we're doing calls to the REST API uh, to find out items in a collection or things of that nature and structure them in a way that you can apply them into the templates. And then you can box up this stuff into a module, modularized things so that you could actually have a third party module or, or an extension module, or there's even modules within DSpace for, for how we deal with collections versus communities versus item um, modules. Um, and we're going to see all these concepts and go into the code here in a little bit more detail. But this is for the basics of kind of how this all fits together. Um, and we're going to go through these in this, this general order here as well. So we're going to start with templates. Templates are what compose our HTML, um, simply put. Um, and they're used by components. We're going to get into that as, um, as the next stage after templates. And, that's the other, and we'll get to the other ones after that. So templates really are HTML-like. Almost every single HTML tag is valid. I have a, I, this is how, what it says on the Angular side. I've actually not found an HTML tag that isn't valid, the opposite of that. So I'm not sure what, what tags are not yet valid, <laughs> to be honest. But on the Angular side, they say almost every HTML is valid. So um, if anybody does find HTML tags that don't work in templates, let us know so we can uh, figure out ways around that, of course. Uh, so templates can load other components via their HTML tag. Each component has its own HTML tag. And you're going to see what that looks like in a moment. So it allows component or templates to load components and components to load components to make a very modularized look and feel. Um, and components have their own templates as well. So we're going to go into the syntax behind templates. Um, this is an example template. It's not the full thing. It's just uh, showing you that it is HTML-like with some extra stuff in there, some extra magic. So in this particular case, uh, we, are, we have a template that is going to be displaying our top-level communities, which you may have been able to guess because of the fact that you can see a variable called top-level communities here. Um, so something, and we'll get to what, what does this later on, something has created a variable called top-level communities. Um, once this top-level communities has responded, has succeeded, so once we pulled them down from the REST API, um, this if statement, this is an if statement with an Angular, so this asterisk ng if, is a special um, property on a sort of HTML-like tag that says, once that has occurred, display this div. Until that does occur, this is invisible to the user. The HTML does not appear until our top-level communities have been pulled down via the REST API. So if statements in Angular, this is how they're structured. You have an if statement, and then there you have something that is a Boolean. Um, I'm going to get more into what some of this other stuff is. The async is just saying it's an asynchronous request, um, but we'll get into that a little bit more. So assuming that has completed, um, then we're going to display what's in our div. So here's an example of a translated uh, key. So we have something called a home top-level communities header, which if you're familiar with, you know, internationalization keys, um, this is how they're handled in Angular. 
So there's something that is this key, you pass it, you pipe it to translate, which is just a keyword within the Angular uh, language that says, I want to grab the translation from that key of whatever the user's current language is. So if they're using English, it's going to grab the English translated version of that key. If it's, um, if it's Spanish or whatever else, French, it's going to grab the, the other translated version. So it's going to stick that in an H2 tag. That's a normal HTML H2 tag. Uh, we got a normal paragraph with a normal uh, CSS class. And here's another translated uh, key that it's grabbing down and sticking into that uh, paragraph that with, uh, with certain CSS properties. Uh, you can then see a, um, an unordered list here, which I don't have closed down here because it ran out of space. But we have a for statement now. Here's an Angular for statement. Asterisk ng is kind of how Angular likes to um, start all of their various uh, uh, sort of looping and, and if statement sort of things. So we're doing for uh, let community of top level communities dot payload. So what this is doing is it's saying for every community within this top level communities list that comes back, the payload is the list of communities that comes back. We're going to loop through every community there, and for each community, we're going to print out this li. And within that li, we then have a paragraph that is grabbing things about the community. So you get the community's name out. You get the community's short description out, sticking those in some spans. And we have a special property here within Angular, this thing called a router link, uh, which is basically a, a shorter syntax for developing your paths. So it's saying, um, I'm just going to create a path to our slash communities and stick the community ID on the end of that. So that's just an easier way than having to type out um, the full URL pattern. So that ends up translating into whatever your URL pattern is in your Angular app, and communities on the end, and then putting a specific community ID onto there. So that's creating a link to that particular community page um, within your Angular application. Is that also needed for the Angular Universal? Or the Yes, that's so Angular. It's also a, a, a property that Angular Universal is, is aware of. So that's just kind of how you um, how you how you do that as sort of uh, local links or relative links within an Angular application. Is you always use this router link property in square brackets. So some of the syntaxes here are sort of weird when you first get into this. The fact that Angular likes to create uh, asterisk ng statements. And then these sort of square bracket properties, and you also eventually see some parentheses properties as well, and they have different sorts of meanings, which we're going to get into here in a little bit. Uh, yeah, Mark. So, so what's going on here with the weird syntax is this is not HTML yet. It's it is be. HTML, but it's building. Um, it, it allows you to have ifs and for loops within HTML. So this is going to be transformed into the final HTML. Yes. This. So this is the template. The template is very HTML-like, but it allows you to have if statements, for loops, things of that nature to kind of simplify so you don't have to you know, create the entire HTML from scratch. Yeah, so it's a, a text template that you know, a lot of the content of it is HTML. Correct. Yep. And like I said, um, Angular advertises this. Almost every HTML tag and every HTML property um, works out of the box. I've yet to find one that doesn't, but if we find one, we should note it. But that's part of the reason also for these weird special syntaxes. So HTML is never going to have something that starts with an asterisk in G, which is why they're using that to signify loops and if statements. And HTML also doesn't have properties surrounded with square brackets or parentheses. You always have things like class, and that's an HTML property. Um, so that's the other reason for the weird syntax there as well. So Angular's tried to figure out some other ways they can syntactically represent this in an HTML-based template. If that makes sense. But you could just as easily add other H1s in here, other paragraphs, um, things of that nature, and it's all completely valid um, in terms of just tweaking templates easily and quickly. And hopefully that's very clear in how that sort of works. And you'll see as we get into components how components are very powerful to be able to move around in the same sort of way via HTML structures. Any other questions or comments on the topic side? We'll see some more of this as we go too. Okay, so uh, this is where I get into some of these other um, syntax things. These are hints. There's actually a good hints page on uh, the Angular site. I'm very 
um, very common template syntax things. Uh, I pulled out the big ones that we use frequently. So you get, get these squirrely brackets around some sort of uh, object dot value or just even an object. That's just grabbing out and printing the value of whatever that variable is. Um, so that's a JavaScript variable of some sort, and it's going to print out that value if you if you surround it in the double squiggly brackets. If you have these square brackets, um, what this is actually doing is it's creating a property or it's setting a property to the value of whatever is in here. And this again is a JavaScript value. So square brackets are setting a property. In this case, it would be setting um, the divs class, which is a valid HTML property, to whatever the value is of object.class. And this is some sort of uh, variable within uh, JavaScript. So whatever that outputs would be set to an HTML property called class. So that's a very basic example. So um, Angular always call, says that square brackets are going like right to left. So you're grabbing what's out of here and you're putting it into here. Whereas uh, parentheses go left to right, <laughs> which is sort of a, a they call it binding uh, in the Angular terminology. So here you have a button. And when somebody clicks that button, this is an action. When they clicks that button, it calls a method. And this method, as you'll see, it, it is defined in a component, which we'll get to in a second. So there's a method that gets called that does something, and it passes an event to that method, which is the fact that they click this, and then something's going to happen. Um, and we'll get to that a little bit more. So this is like a, a left to right action. This is a right to left action. And then strangely, you can embed the two together, which gets kind of crazy. So now it's like a left to right and right to left. Uh, which means that when, um, so you got a component here, when this title gets changed, it, it, uh, the title goes into the name variable, and when the name changes, the name goes into the title property. And I'm not going to get into that in a ton of detail, but it basically allows for very dynamic, automatic saving capabilities. So if you think about a web form, and um, say you're editing an item, uh, and you want to edit its title, as soon as you type that new title in, it's automatically saved back into uh, DSpace. And as soon as a save happens at the DSpace level, it automatically syncs back up to your web form. Um, so it's kind of like a two-way sync process of where that data gets saved. Um, and it's called two-way binding as I mentioned there. Uh, there's also, and it's the equivalent of down here, that you can do it in this syntactic uh, sort of form, but it's also the same as this. So this is the left to right and right to last version, so um, it, if you're updating the title, it changes name, and if you change the title, it clicks and creates an event that changes, um, oh wait, I did it the wrong way. If you change the name, it goes to the title, and if the title changes, it goes to the name. Um, but that's the longer syntax there. And that does get a little bit weird to understand along the way, but it becomes a little bit more sec second nature as you start to work more with components. Um, and it doesn't happen very frequently within the eSpace 7 code base. We are much more often to use the patterns of these first three, because there's not a whole lot of places where you're working with, uh, this is mostly useful in the form situation where you're working with forms. Um, as I noted here as well, we have these asterisk sort of syntax. You got if statement. So you're only going to show this tag if whatever's in there is true. Um, you got the for statement, so you're going to repeat this tag for everything inside a list. And this is just how you define that by item of the list. So for every item in the list, you're going to have a new li. Um, and then there's another one here. Um, there's some special properties here, like ng class is just creating that is another way of updating the class property in HTML. So the HTML class on this div. Uh, would be set to the value active if this evaluates to true. So that's another syntactic way to be able to say if a certain thing is true, I want to set one class on it. If another thing is, is true, then I'm going to change my class to something else uh, just to provide different ways of uh, enabling CSS. So there's great cheat sheets and template syntax guides on the Angular side of things that allow you to get much more deep into explaining really good examples for all of these and how you would use each of these. But these are, these are basic sort of uh, structures within a template uh, that allow you to, to generate that HTML much more easily um, within Angular. I know those may not be all 100% clear, but hopefully that gets you the basics of what you'd be working with um, within these templates and how you can kind of structure uh, templates to create HTML. So that's the basics of composing HTML within a template. 
Um, within, so we're going to go into uh, components here to talk about how these work, and these are tied very closely to templates. And this is these two together are the are the big concepts here behind um, behind Angular and how you create a custom theme, um, modify the look and feel. Um, most of that is going to be down in the template layer, but you'll want to kind of understand a little bit of what's going on in the components, unless you're doing basic changes like just changing uh, CSS properties, moving around HTML. That can all be done at the template layer. Um, the other two things we'll get to um, in a bit here. So. Components are really the building blocks of Angular. Uh, they are what, um, what Angular is based off of and create the modularity that exists within Ang Angular and allow you to essentially create new HTML tags, custom tags. And so we have DS tags that we're creating for DSpace that provide our DSpace components. You can name them whatever you want, as you'll see. You can create your own custom components locally. Um, you can share them within modules, which you'll see in a little bit as well. Um, but they consist of a view and a controller, so they're very much kind of a MVC programming model. So the model that's coming back is coming from like the REST API, and then the template is like, has a controller aspect, which are kind of JavaScript uh, methods, um, and then the view aspect, which is the templates that we, that we saw. So everything literally on a page is a component. So this is a, an example item page. Um, and I've circled all the various sort of components here. Um, in our current code base, we have a header component and a footer component, so if you want to modify those, those are separated out into their own template. You can just tweak that template briefly, and it's modified across the entire site. Um, we have thumbnail uh, components uh, to, to display the thumbnail. This one doesn't happen to have one, and file components to display the file list. We have uh, collection list components. We're actually object list components where you have different types of object lists. In this case, it's a collection. Uh, we also have item list components, which, which would display a list of items. And then we have a metadata field components, which all inherit from each other. Um, so if you want to display a date, it's going to be in a date format that comes out. Authors are, are ordered very specifically, and you may want them um, uh, in that, to appear in that specific order, of course. You can move that around. URIs and links need to have be hyperlinked, an abstract may have its own sort of display, and titles may be bolded and all that sort of stuff. So you can have different uh, customized components and look and feel based on the, the type of metadata field that's coming back. And in Angular, actually, the entire application itself is a component. So all these components are nested within an overarching app component, which is the Angular application. So it's components all the way down, essentially, within Angular. And a component is where we get into more of these Java sort of uh, functionality. So we can implement interfaces. A component can say, I want to, I do something when I'm initialized on init, and I do something when I shut down on destroy. It can implement various interfaces that are out there. It can extend another component, where um, one component may return something, the other one can extend it and enhance the look and feel or change some functionality there. They all come with a selector, which is the HTML tag they respond to. So a component called a news component could be represented by a tag named news. Um, and that looks like a normal HTML tag, and you treat it like a normal HTML tag in your templates, but what it's actually doing is saying, this is where my news component exists, and this is where I want that to load within my templates. Uh, they have constructors <coughs> that define what you pass into them, if anything. They don't necessarily have to have something. Uh, they all come with a view, which is their own template, and then methods, which are the actions, the controller stuff. Yeah. I'm just okay. curious why for the over for the application as a whole to be a component. Do you, is it so that it can act with other apps? Uh, no, it's really because these things are, are nestable is the concept. So essentially templates call components and components include templates and templates call components and components. So it's nestable all the way down. So it starts at the very top with the application component being the overarching HTML page. So it creates oh, the structure of the page, and then within that you can have components that are that build that structure. So, so, so it's just overarching HTML. Yeah, like the HTML head area and things of that nature. Um, and then uh, in our instance, we have a separate header and footer component that get loaded after in the, in the HTML body. Um, but the overall app component generates that body tag right now. That's what allows you to basically create like a nested HTML structure. Essentially, the concept there. Go ahead, Mark. A little more abstractly, it seems to me that if the 
application wasn't a component itself, it would have to be something else. And now we have something else that only has one mm -hmm. purpose. Okay. And it does exactly what something else does. Right. Yeah, I think that is kind of why they structured it. So there is literally an app component file, an app component HTML, which is the overall thing, and it just creates that head HTML head, HTML body, and then it calls mm -hmm. the other call that that goes with that. Yeah. That it needs. And Tim, has there been any thought of like where um, how a <coughs> DSpace instance would start doing customizations on these components, or is that? Uh... I think that's something we want to get more feedback about. So there's a lot of power here in terms of where we, how we can make this easier for people to make certain customizations. So we've done our best to componentize everything to the point that. So it should be easy to not manage the header, because you can go into the header component and tweak that, footer, all that's the same sort of thing. Um, managing titles site-wide is quite easy. Um, like your, your example of doing um, uh, art, artists want to be saved, said that it's shown as artists and authors want to be authors. That should be relatively simple, but you just go into the author component and say, if it's an artist, do an artist, text artist, if it's author, do author, um, that sort of thing. So we want to be able to make this as componentized and easy to tweak as possible, but you know, there's always going to be some sort of limitations that occur based on how we componentize things. So I think that's where I'm really hoping to get more feedback from people as you're starting to learn this structure and as you're playing with the code on are we providing um, boundaries in any way that would be hard for you to work with this, or is there ways we could do it better? So, so we've tried to, to make it as easy as possible to work with, but we would like to do that. And we are very much still working on the best practices of how to tweak all this stuff, but we're trying to keep all those things in mind that we're all very well aware of the people want to modify. Uh, Mark, go ahead. So if you find yourself forcing the tool, complain. <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly. If you start to play around with it and you, you do something locally, or you know you do something locally that might be difficult on this model, complain. <laughs> let us know. And the earlier you let us know, the, the quicker we can keep that in mind. But I mean, the people who are working on this are major service providers who work with a lot of institutions to provide services. Um, we do some of that with Endura Space as well. I'm trying to keep that all in mind as well. We also have individual institutions with their own various needs. So we're trying to keep all of these needs in mind, but the more people who can give us new needs and new uh, gotchas that they see, the better, because that way we can kind of try and balance this all out and make sure it's going to be beneficial for everybody and make it easier. Other questions right now, we'll go ahead and go along here. Um, so I covered all of this. Um, so here we're going to actually look into component sort of code. <coughs> So here's, this is again another template, and here's an example of, of where we're calling our, our header component. So we, we named our header component ds-header. We purposely named all the dspace out of the box components starting with ds-dash, so that that makes it easier for you to define things locally, and it's not going to conflict with our component name, so just don't define your component's name ds-dash. And you'll have no problem. You can create whatever components you want locally, or you can modify the behavior of the DS dash components if you want locally. But that's kind of the, the name convention we've started using for DSpace 7. Um, and that's just important to note because you can name these literally anything you want. You obviously don't want to name it something that would conflict with HTML tags because that would be really weird too. I wouldn't want to call this head um, or anything of that nature. But you want to name it something that you know that makes sense to your institution as you're creating more components. So this is literally how you call a header component. And here's our footer component down here as well. And you can see we've just got it in a div, a uh, header appear here, the footer appear here, there's a main tag here in the middle. Um, and so you can move things around. If, if one of these was like a side menu, you can move the side menu around just by dragging this tag and sticking it wherever you want to stick it. Um, in terms of the components. It's all modifiable as the location it appears within that template. And so behind that is a component class. So this is um, a class uh, in TypeScript that defines that DS header component. And you'll see here it's got a selector. So it, it starts with this at component, which, is, uh, which defines that this class is implementing a component. And so this is a special um, syntax within, within uh, Angular to define components. A component must have a selector, and so that's the tag it gets identified as, so it's a DS header tag. Um, and it, 
it can optionally have its own CSS. So you can actually have a separate CSS file for every single component if you want. You don't have to do it that way. You, we also have global CSS so that things apply globally. But it gives you a lot of power so that each individual component can actually look slightly different if you want it to look different in different scenarios. So you can have its own separate CSS file. It, it loads up its own template. So since it's its own little tag, there's something going on underneath that tag. And that tag has HTML behind it, which is, a, um, which is named right here. It's just called header.component.html. And so the HTML behind that tag um, is there. Alternatively, you don't have to have it be a separate file. In this case, it's a separate HTML file. You can actually embed the HTML that's behind the component right in this definition if you wanted to. That gets a little ugly because you're mixing TypeScript and HTML. It's an option you can use if they're very tiny components. But we've been doing the best practice of trying to separate these out into HTML files, so it's really obvious where you can go to modify the HTML um, for anything you want to work with. You just look for things that end in actually HTML, um, and that's where you can tweak uh, the theme and the look and feel. So this is defined as a component. Those are the properties that are required of a component. Uh, we export uh, this class. We give it a name. We're calling this one header component. Uh, this one happens to implement an interface, which it does something when it initializes. Uh, and this class has a property that's is nav bar collapsed, and it's a Boolean value, so it starts out as, as just an empty property. Uh, when it initializes, so it implements on init, init tells us that we have to implement a method called ng on init. That's what the on init um, uh, interface is. So when it initializes, it's going to start out with is navbar collapse equal true. So it's just going to initialize that value to true. Um, and so as you might expect, that's going to collapse the navigation bar. You'll actually see how that works on the next page here. So it's starting out as being collapsed. And then we're creating a toggle method down here that allows us to just flip the value back and forth. So if it was true, it turns it to false. If it, was, if it was false, it turns it to true. So you can toggle it open and close sort of thing. Um, so that's like a very basic sort of component, which is a header that has a nav bar of some sort that's toggleable. And behind that, so here's the template that goes along with it. So we've got our class, and we've got our template. So this is the separate template file. The template file, we have an HTML button. When you click that button, look, it calls toggle. So this method here, this method call, is going back and calling this method within our component class. So that's an example of actually seeing that the click action is calling a JavaScript or a TypeScript method that's back in our component class. And that, that JavaScript method, remember, changes the value back and forth. So that's the toggleable aspect. It just has some, some uh, accessibility stuff here. And it's got a span that just displays a little a logo of, the, of bars and stuff like that. So that's normal HTML with some bootstrap stuff um, in there. Uh, then we have a div here that uh, has a value of, or a, a property here called ngb collapse. This is where we're, we're using a third party plugin for Bootstrap. Um, Bootstrap, again, is just a theming uh, framework. Um, and there's an ng bootstrap, which is allowing us to use Bootstrap within Angular. Angular prefixes everything with ng. You'll get familiar with that very quickly. All the third party plugins are ng dash. Um, so ng bootstrap uh, comes with this little uh, property here that if we set collapse, it calls the bootstrap collapse thing, which moves to open and close things using the bootstrap um, automated uh, or JavaScript that's built within it. And so that's just doing, that's setting that value to our value of this variable, which again came back from our, oops, I went back the way. Uh, so is nav our collapse is in our component, and this variable here corresponds to this variable here. So we can call the, the properties of our component within its template. So we're able to kind of collapse and uncollapse that based on the value of that property. And you can see again, we have uh, another, this is another area of that router link. We have that different syntax for router link. This is a slightly different syntax where we're creating a, a link to just the home page um, and providing that translation ticket for translation um, key. Uh, to translate the home, uh, home location. So that's just opening and closing the nav bar and allowing us to toggle that value um, if, up, up here within that button. So when you click the button, it calls toggle. Toggle calls this method here, which changes our value of this variable. 
And when that value of the variable changes, that flips the value here, which tells Bootstrap, now I'm going to you know, collapse or close, collapse or close um, along the way. So it's kind of they're all intertwined in the, what happens between the, the, um, the actual actions within the methods and what is in the template itself. Does that make some sense today? Yeah. If you wanted to do just like a plain old JavaScript event kind of thing like you do in jQuery today, mm -hmm. would you still write it in the Angular way or will you still like have a jQuery layer or some other client JavaScript layer doing CSS shifts and other kinds of things? Um, well, the bootstrap stuff brings in, I believe it brings in some version. I'm trying to remember what version of jQuery bootstrap. I don't know if anybody else here knows offhand. Bootstrap, I know, has its own J JavaScript um, that comes along with it. Mark, do you know? <laughs> no, no. Okay. I'm, I'm thinking that great parenthesis, play parenthesis, then that's something that's significant to the, you know, the template engine. If you just wrote on click, the template engine says you wrote exactly. on click, it's yours. Yep, yeah, so that, that would be how you would do it. Um, I was just trying to think of how you, if you can bring in jQuery separate or if jQuery is already in this. I think it's already in this, and it comes as part of the bootstrap for part of things. So I think jQuery is already there to play with. But Mark is correct, if you just treat this, treat this as if it's HTML, Again, in templates, you could just write HTML. You can choose to ignore Angular altogether. It makes it a little bit harder to do everything you want to do, but you can create it as HTML. So if you wrote this as onclick and called a jQuery method, it would treat it as just jQuery and pass it along as regular HTML. But since it's written in these parentheses click, it knows that you're using the um, Angular syntax and it's going to go find toggle inside the components um, TypeScript class. So, so there's, there are different options for how you can work with JavaScript here, for sure. Questions, comments? So hopefully, is this making some sense? Just, I'm just trying to get a sense of people's, yeah, making some sort of sense a little bit. So I see some nods, yes. Because if, if there's big questions, I'd love to get some of them out here so we can improve this as we go, or at the end here as well. Um, we're trying to improve these materials to make it even clearer how, how all this works together. I realize there's some new concepts here, though, of course. Does anyone have a question now? What's that? I wonder if anyone does have a question now. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, does anybody have any questions? You have? I, I guess I just have a comment. So I'm, I'm trying to make a parallel between the the templates that we have now for the XML UI, right? So with the templates now, you're you're taking XML and you're running through the XSLT template and creating something new. With this, you've got quote templates, but they're not. I mean, they're not yeah. really the same thing, you know. They're, no, you know, with this, you're yeah. writing more almost HTML. Yeah, you it's have like to understand HTML. That, yeah. Yeah, you're just yeah. creating your own HTML, yeah. but. You do need to understand some of the Angular syntax things that yeah. will be built into that if you want to trigger various Angular methods. Yeah. Um, but as as Terry noted, like if you wanted to actually just write HTML with jQuery and hit jQuery stuff, you can just do that as if it's just HTML. You no longer need to have developers who understand XSL and XML and all that sort of stuff. You can have HTML developers potentially learn this as long as they understand the basics behind some of these things like what parentheses click does. <laughs> they don't even understand all the gist and the nitty gritty, but if they just understand that's going to do an action, I don't need it. I don't want to remove that just because it looks like that. But it didn't validate HTML because it actually is doing something. But yeah, I'm hoping that it brings more people into templating for DSpace because it should be more HTML-like. I, I think the thing is it's just getting used to the syntax yeah. Of what's being used here and what happens in a component versus what happens in a template. And right. Components. Yeah, and understanding that components really are just templates as well. They're just kind of creating a special tag around another template. So it's like a template within a template within a template. So even if you don't understand components necessarily fully, just understand that there's nested templates and that you can tweak the HTML in various areas based on the, the, the template name. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, almost, it's almost like the XML UI thing in reverse because it seems like with the, with the templates, with the XML templates, you know, you're running through and first you're getting your XML process and you're getting the, the XML in order and then at the last step you're creating the HTML from that. Yeah. Whereas with this, you're like kind of got the bones of your HTML right from the start and then you're filling in pieces of it by writing these templates. Yeah, I mean, I think if somebody were coming at this versus 
either this or XML, this would be way easier. Right, yeah, that's, that's what our hope is, is that this should be a lot easier for people to work with. And that you could even get somebody who just knows bootstrap theming and HTML to come in and work on your theme. Yeah. And that it will be a lot easier for them to do that um, in this sort of structure. The other thing is the components are dynamically loading little slices of data yeah. as needed as opposed to today. Everything has to be available yeah. 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 at the start. Yeah. Yeah. Mark, do you have a question or comment? The thing is, this kind of separation only works if you document your component so that you can tell the, you know, the, the web page people, here's a dictionary of the, you know, the magic incantations you can add to HTML and what they do. Mm -hmm. You don't have to know how, we, how they do it, they'll just do it. Mm -hmm. That's a good point, yeah. yeah. Just making sure we clearly document our components and everybody understands where the code is, how the code is structured so you can find these templates easily. I think we did the new last time. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. um, so now when I'm working on, on DSpace, you know, I've got the uh, XML UI and I'm looking at different XSL files, page structure XSL file, item XSL file. And, uh, to kind of uh, create the, the look and feel that I want. Um, will the components be identified in such a way that if you, you want to change the item view, you'll know exactly which components you'll go to? Yeah, so yeah, that is something we're trying to make clear right now. And that's something I think we could also use feedback on. The way Components generally are structured with Angular, although it's optional to do it this way. But the way we've been doing it is we've been trying to create each component as its own sort of folder. And we try and name this clearly as we can. So we have an item view folder that is the item view com component. So it's almost like more of the JSP structure where uh -huh. you could go down and you could see there's a header folder right. and header components under that. There's a footer folder and the footer components under that. So we're trying to structure it more like that. But even that naming convention sometimes gets a little wishy-washy sometimes because you have things that are shared between areas. So there's like pagination you want to look similar across when you're paging through items across various components. So we're, work, we're working towards that goal, but I think we could use a lot of feedback on does our code structure make sense? Are we structuring things in a way that is useful, that is helpful for everybody? So in a lot of ways. Just a second. Mark was next. Mm -hmm. Amen to that. Yeah, there's a lot of time trying to, to figure out the, <coughs> there's this visual element on my screen. Right. Where in the code was that created? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I lose hours mm -hmm. trying to track those down. Right. Yeah. And so there's also a special naming convention here that we are following strictly with Angular that's recommended. So you'll kind of notice here um, we can call these things almost whatever we want. But Angular recommends you call the component class the same as what you're calling these files. So this thing's called a header. This is a header part of the header component. We name it header component, header component, and then and we're just prefixing with ds there. You could technically name this whatever you want, but we're trying to create a very specific structure so that if you want to change the header, you can either go to that header folder or you can uh, grab header start.html or whatever and find where that is right away. Um, in your in the folder structure, we're trying to name things as clearly as we can. But again, that's something we can use feedback on if we're structuring this well, um, and it makes sense to people. Yeah, I think I may just be having an aha moment in terms of um, the when you're looking. So we've been looking at little bits of, of code, okay. yeah. but if we were looking at the whole thing, it would be much more modular than like. XML, where you're looking at this massive document of templates and stuff like that. Is that yes, true? yeah. And so here, maybe this will help. Um, I was going to show this at the end or near the end, anyways, but let's go to. No, that's <laughs> terrible. We've seen it a lot. Yeah. Okay, so we go to our DSpace Angular project here. Um, and I'm going to get into this a little bit later, but everything in, in an Angular application is under source app. But if, once I get down under here, we'll start to see the components appear. Collection page component, community page component, header. Um, some of these are still a little bit, uh, the footer has not been pulled out properly. We need to do that still. But if I go to the community page, you'll start to see 
We've got a CSS that you can actually add in there. Some of these are empty CSS, but if you wanted to tweak how a community collection page looks, um, you've got the HTML behind the collection page right there. Um, and then the same for each of these various components. So, yeah, that's the idea is to have these um, folders yeah. that clearly lay out each of the components. And you can just go into that folder to tweak its HTML. But, you know, we can only do it as good as we are, as long as we are making the same assumptions you all are. So, if we're making bad assumptions on things, I mean, help us <laughs> say, look, I don't understand how in the world I would tweak this. And actually, when I'm looking at this, I see there's a header, but I don't see the footer one. So, we must have the footer one embedded somewhere somewhere in here, um, which means that there's a problem. Um, it probably is under core. Uh, yeah, there it is. Yeah, so the footer component somehow got embedded under core, um, but the header one is at the top level, where they should both be at the top level. So that's something I'll go back and report as a bug that we need to pull that one out, because that's a common one that we're going to watch. But this is, this is exactly what we're trying to create as a structure that <laughs> makes it easier to work with. <laughs> Just yeah, um, how's the tooling? You know, one thing I'm really enjoying about this like front end development is the oh to find the code that matches this visual element. You know, I just right click and yeah, I use Inspector. Yeah. This the like web development tooling is so good. What am I What am I doing development in to, to do this? Am, am I using it on IDE? Yes. Yeah. There are IDEs that understand Angular natively and TypeScript natively. Um, the best free one out there is actually the TypeScript IDE provided by uh, Microsoft, which is Visual Code Studio, or Visual Studio Code, or something like that. Yeah. It used to be Visual Studio, and I, I remember I used it a long time ago, and I hated it. It's the worst IDE out there. But I tried it again. Try it again. <laughs> In this sort of frame of mind, uh, it's very nice to work with. It does great debugging capabilities. Um, being able to like step through code and all of that. Um, browsers now, like Google Chrome especially, you can actually do some debugging within the browser itself. So there's browser plugins that understand Angular structures, and so they allow you to step through the code a little bit or give you hints as to where problems are um, within the browsers themselves. We started a resources page on this on the wiki for various tools that people, um, uh, that we found useful. Um, there's still, Things that we can enhance about that, because right now it's mostly just a list of tools. <laughs> we need to provide more guidance on this, but it's mostly because we're still learning how to use some of these tools ourselves and find it, and having new discoveries all the time. We're like, oh wow, we can debug this, like step through it in, in Chrome, and this works so much easier in, in some situations. So, so things like that, I think we can improve upon. But the tools, the tools are there, and they're getting better and better. Um, it's quite impressive with just the capability to, to do some of this work. And there are other IDEs as well available. There is an Intelli IntelliJ natively works with it as well. That's a pay one. Um, there's, um, there's a couple other ones too. I'm trying to think of what other ones. Uh, there's also things that are lower level than IDEs like Atom, which is more of a text editor, but it understands TypeScript and can give you TypeScript errors before you do compilation and things like that. Um, so there's other sort of tools out there that, we, that we're using as well. Any other questions before I move on to some of the other concepts? Because these are the two biggest concepts to understand is the, 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 um, the templates and the components. So I want to make sure that we get the questions here. The other two, I feel like a little bit more behind the scenes. You're not going to have to interact with them as much. Um, they might be useful in some situations, but I want to make sure that these are pretty crystal or at least crystal enough um, going home today. <laughs> Other questions for now? Okay. If there's anything else that comes up, stop me. I'm glad to try and talk through these a little bit more here. Uh, what time are we? Oh, we're ending at three. Wow. We've gone through time like crazy. I, I think three thirty. There's a three thirty. Well, we have a. Oh, there's a break from three to three thirty. People just kind of okay. Break, so okay. Yeah, yeah, the last two are a little brief right anyway, so we'll get into, we'll do these real quick. These, those are the two I wanted to spend the most time on anyway. So we have this idea of services. So we're working with the, the data and components and providing methods to do things, and the templates are created in our HTML. The way we get our data is through services. So the main service here um, for DSpace 7 is really just interacting with the REST API. It's just a way of grabbing information out of the REST API. Um, and so um, services are kind of like reusable chunks of code. So you, you mostly use them for the REST API, but if there are other sort of methods that you want to share across components, Rather than duplicating them in multiple components, you can pull them out of the service and just load the service into the component. 
Um, and that's a way of just not um, not duplicating your little methods or chunks of code that you want to have in various places. So, um, so they're used globally. They're loaded up kind of globally. Um, they they can do they can grab data from like a REST API for components. Uh, they can also do things like modify data, the things you would call when you're actually sending modifications. You're, you're modifying an item um, or you're in an edit item page. You, uh, the service would get called behind the scenes to actually do that edit, and it would call the REST API. So the service is kind of your interface to the REST API, essentially. And they also support things like dependency injection. So this is something you're not really going to need to do much with, but it's worth understanding if you want to get in the code some. Uh, so this is where if a service, if you find reusable chunks of code, you might want to separate those out into a service, um, and you, you can make those injectable so they're easy to load within other components. So this is an item data service that exists. To make it injectable, you just put this um, this little proper or this um, annotation on it at injectable. That now that define tells Angular I have this thing that's a, that's a class that defines some methods within it. Um, so I left out all the methods and what it defines, but it defines some method in this class. It's injectable. So by doing that, that now means that in any component you want, you can just pass that in as into the constructor of this component, and it knows that when you pass in that service you now have um, access to all the methods um, of that service in this items uh, variable. So anytime you now use that items variable in this component, it's referencing that service and it can call any of the methods immediately. That's all the dependency injection requires within the Angular realm. So just define an injectable and then just start using it in your component and that's it. Um, so it's kind of a nice way to be able to create services that do whatever you want them to do. Mostly right now they're interacting with the REST API and, and using them across components. So here's our REST API or a snippet of a REST API uh, service. Uh, we have a REST v2 service. It's got a constructor. It takes in an, an HTTP, um, a separate HTTP service, which is a module coming from Angular, so it's just using that to be able to do HTTP requests. And then it's got a get method that, um, that it can request a URL, it can pass some request options along that are optionable, um, and it sends this uh, using that HTTP uh, service, it gives it does a get request and sends those off. I'm not going to go through this in a ton of detail, but it's basically sending them off, um, and then uh, catching any errors down here and logging them to the Angular console if anything comes back as an error. So that's kind of the gist of it. There's a little bit more in here. Um, there's this concept of observables, which I'll mention very briefly if I get a chance here, but it's not a, um, a one that is well understood. Mostly you're not going to touch this area of code, but this is an example of what a service could do. And that, that's the gist of a service. A service is just methods. Um, that's all it is. It's a class that defines methods. Those methods can be shared amongst components. Um, it doesn't have any view, it doesn't do anything else. Most of our services right now are just ways of interacting with the REST API. Um, but you could define other services that just have other methods that you want to share across components. And then there's this idea of modules. All modules are is they're a way of packaging up um, components and or services. So you can say, I want to create it. You could, if you wanted to put all of your local customizations into a thing called a module. You could just say, I've created three custom components and I have had one custom service and I'm going to call this the Georgetown module. Um, and that's, it's packaged up into a Georgetown module and that module, when you include it in an Angular project, includes those three components and the one service that you create. So it's just a way of packaging things up and, and allowing you to redistribute them if you wanted to. Um, via like a, a package manager like the NPM, the node package manager, things of that nature, um, if you wanted to share them more broadly, or you just packaging them up, package them up internally for your own use. So it's just allowing you to organize your application uh, and package stuff up. And the Angular app itself, because I mean everything is kind of it's using its own thing. The Angular app itself is its it's its own module. It's also got its own component. It's a module itself that includes itself as its component, and it has that top level template. So it really tries to it makes you kind of understand that everything is is uh, is a module with components and templates. Uh, you don't have to use modules at all. That's to they're totally optional. You can just use a ton of components and templates, um, but they're a way of kind of separating up bits of functionality for to be more redistributable. 
Um, and that's, those are the main four elements here. Like I mentioned, the templates and the components of the two you most want to dig into and understand a little bit. Uh, the other two are, are a little bit more if you want to get into coding um, and helping us in, in development, uh, they'll come up a little bit more. Um, one side note, and I might actually skip this, but I'll get a little bit of time here. So uh, there's this idea of observables, which you saw up here in one of those um, uh, as a return value in here. An observable string is being returned from this method. And you also saw this concept in one of the templates of a payload being typed to instant. This is a concept that is a little bit weird to wrap your head around. And I admit, I still don't have my head wrapped entirely around it. I've got a good gist of it. But an observable is, is something within, um, it's not just Angular specific. It's, it's, a, it's a reactive programming concept, which means Everything, they say everything is a stream, and what that, that sounds really cool and fancy and all that, but what it really means is that when you're using REST APIs and things of that nature and doing more um, uh, JavaScript-based development, as values change on the back end, as if things change, if somebody modifies an item and stuff, you want that to appear almost immediately on the front. And so all the data points that are coming between the REST API and the Angular app, it's kind of an ongoing stream, so values get updated automatically as they're changed on the back end and they just keep coming forward to the front. And so that's what an observable is. It's this lazy wrapper around some data. And it, it only gets unpacked and displayed at the moment that you ask for it. So um, when you're actually building a page, when you're building an item page, at that moment the person hits that item page, it's gonna grab all that information about that item at that moment. But if the next moment the title changes, the next time they hit that page, it's going to grab it at that moment, and now you got a slightly different title. So it's like an instantaneous sort of asynchronous um, um, interaction. Yes, Mark? Yeah, so instead of returning a value from that field, you're returning a dormant function that gets called and mentioned it. Yes, exactly. So instead of returning a value, you're returning this thing called an observable, which kind of wraps the value. And then you pipe, when you do this pipe async, you're saying, okay, I know this is going to return an observable. I want the value as of right now, the asynchronous value. And that's all it's doing is pipe async just unwraps that wrapper and says, here's the value currently. If it changes in the next second, and you reload this page, it's going to change. But here it is right now that I know it. Um, so this is a weird sort of concept of, of reactive programming and stuff. And, and I admit that's, that's the gist of how I kind of understand it. And Tom, do you have more to, I saw you break. Yeah. Not when I mentioned reactive programming. I'm, so, I'm super into it. <laughs> it's often described as this really advanced kind of programming that you need to, literally, that you need a PhD for. There's many that are written about it. Right. But um, the, the example that we all know and don't, and we think of as very low, is Excel, which is functional reactive programming. Um, and it's this uh, updated values all the time, only when you want it. Right. Uh, it's not exactly this. I mean, it's exactly the same, but we use it a little differently. Right. Yeah, so it's just something worth wrapping your mind around. Just the idea that um, when you're working with these observables, that's when you have this pipe async just to grab the value out. That's the concept you need to understand. And that, um, that you're kind of, this is all happening automatically within Angular. It's kind of subscribing and listening to the value. And then when you do async, it grabs the value as at that point and unsubscribes. So, and, and this is all managed automatically um, through this RxJS, which is this reactive JavaScript thing that comes with an Angular. But it's just something worth kind of knowing that it's out there. And if you ever start to see errors as you're programming that you're working with an observable, type it to async and you'll get the value up. <laughs> so I kind of need to really worry about it at a high level. It's just that it's this wrapper that, that is around all this data. So, um, so that's the gist of what I'm going to go into. There's a lot more out there, and there are, yeah, there's lots of people talking about reactive programming and all that, but it is a pretty basic concept at this, at this higher level of just being able to grab data when you want it. Um, and here's where, we already went through the code here a little bit, or, or glanced at it, um, but I'll mention that the, the folder structure here, we're trying to follow the best practices of Angular. So you got config files, um, you've got resources, which are mostly static files. That's where your translations are, images that get loaded. Uh, we have some integration testing that happens for our continuous integration um, application stuff. We need more of this, but it's, it's coming along. We're trying to do as much integration testing at that level. Most of the code 
is in source app. Um, that's where the Angular application itself exists. And as you saw under there, we have folder structures for various components. Um, currently, we have this uh, mock REST backend, and this allows us to work in parallel with the REST team. So as the REST team builds a concept for how the next REST API calls will work, so with authentication authorization, they mock up what they think it's going to look like. And we take those mock-ups and we stuff them in here and start using them right away in Angular so that we can actually program against it at the same time we're building the concept behind the scenes. So we have a bunch of mock data under here, which is modeled in the same way that the REST API should respond when we do these calls. And that just allows us to move more quickly. Um, and we've got modules, which is where the root Angular code all sits. We don't really touch that other than to upgrade Angular and stuff like that. You got global style sheets under the styles directory there, but as you saw, you can have style sheets for each component. And when you compile it using Node, it creates this disk directory, which is the distributed version. That's just, it doesn't exist there by default, but it's worth noting that that's how it compiles everything. And that's sort of where um, you're running your code when you're doing your development. So I'm yeah. stuck one slide back. With the reactive components, yes. would that, with like in a DSpace context, would this likely make sense on the admin? Side where you know, like, if you're looking to edit an object that somebody else is editing, you can actually like allow only one editor to edit an item at the same time. Or um, it's more that it just automatically updates in the application <coughs> each time that it's occurred. Okay. So it's not necessarily like live editing, but it's I and mean, you wouldn't see them editing at the same time. But as your editing things, if something changes behind the scenes, those things get pushed to your edit screen as well. So it's almost live-ish editing in okay. a way, because um, it's just an automatic, it's automatically unwrapping each time you're kind of like requesting that data. So the next time you request the data, if it's been updated by somebody else even like a second beforehand, you get the absolute latest data um, in, in that sort of model. Uh, it's hard to go into much more detail right now. There's a lot um, of and if you want to dig deeper, I would actually talk, I'd say we talk to Art more a little bit to okay. give better examples, because Art has his mind, I think, even more around this than I do. I understand the basics and that it's actually not that complex of a concept, but it is treated very complex out in the JavaScript world. Um, it's just a matter of just realizing that it's just a wrapper around stuff and it's grabbing the latest value when you ask for it. Could Would it potentially cut down on the amount of re-indexing as you're, as as you're developing within your key space? Possibly. Uh, that's a little bit more on the back end now. Right. No, it's a good question. It's more of a, it, it helps update the cache quicker. Um, and, and it's also a, a way of um, um, kind of just kind of subscribing to those updates as they're happening. So the cache is automatically updating. It provides a quicker experience, a more up-to-date experience. You're constantly working with the latest data. Um, so it's really more about the data. It's a lot of that real time, more yeah. like real time data loading sort of thing in a lot of ways. Um, but I admit there's even more com more complex concepts there that are underneath it that are built into Angular itself that I don't even quite have my head around. So, Mark, is anybody else here old enough to remember? It's called by name. Is what's going on? Call by name. Anybody remember L Roll sixty? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so that was just the folder structure. I do want to note, I already mentioned this earlier briefly, there is a naming convention we're following, which is the recommended one for Angular, where um, each feature is a component, and they're all in separate subfolders. I showed that already. A component has a naming convention, so all the components files always start with the component name, dot component, and then the extension. So the TS file is the TypeScript, that's TypeScript. Um, so that's the TypeScript file, and that's where you're going to have the actual component TypeScript class, the methods and all that. The HTML file, of course, is the template where you're actually generating HTML out of that component. You can have optional um, uh, styles, uh, and then there can be a, a spec here. These are the, um, the unit tests for the component, um, and we've been trying to do unit testing along the way as well. So uh, these provide the unit test to make sure the component is doing what it's supposed to be doing. Um, and our continuous integration system um, does the, the testing for us. So that's what the spec um, file uh, structure is. Modules then look similar. They, they end with .module.ts. And services, again, have some name .service.ts. So those are, again, TypeScript format. And, and we name them based on whether they're a module, service, or component. That's just how Angular recommends um, structuring and naming uh, your code. 
And, and this was just showing that, uh, yeah, this was, I already kind of talked through this. So we have uh, the app itself is its own component and its own module. So this might be easier to just show in the code here. Um, if I scroll down, so we have all these component folders, but we actually have the app component HTML. So this is the app itself um, loading up uh, the, the upper level header and then the main content and the footer component here, and then everything else is loaded uh, within this thing called router outlet, which is where it loads your current location based on the route you're at. Um, so the app itself is its own component, its own module, and then each other component is in its own subdirectory here. We do have a shared folder right now for things that get shared across multiple components, but we're still trying to figure out how best to structure this. So it's a little bit messy as of right now. So there's stuff that's shared between community and collection, like com call page header. It's a little bit of an ugly name. We're still trying to figure out the best way to, to, to have these components that are obviously shared and used in multiple places, but name them in a way that makes sense to people so you can easily find them and, and edit them along the way. So that's kind of the, the structure there. There's also the core area, which is where we're putting the core components, which are usually things that are used site-wide, so the cache stuff, um, the REST API services, uh, the footer shouldn't actually be here. Um, that's in the wrong place. But there's uh, the index stuff, we're working with uh, indexes and stuff of that nature is all in that area. And, that, and then uh, this is the, la the last couple things is that a, a lot of these things, another thing to understand with uh, the Node Package Manager and Node in general and building a project, a lot of it's controlled by this file called package.json. So this is where it actually compiles things and builds things together. If you're ever wondering where we're pulling in dependencies and how things are being built, that's the file that does it. I'm not going to really go through this in great detail other than to say there's the build area where you can do run various scripts um, using Yarn or Node. Um, and then there's uh, where we pull in all of our, our third-party modules, where we're pulling in our latest version of Angular. We're using Core 3.1. We're using the ng bootstrap module, which is a third party module for the bootstrap uh, theme framework. Uh, we're using this thing called ngrx store, which is almost like a, um, an in, in memory database to do caching of the data. I'm not going to go into that in more detail right now. Um, and then uh, pulling in bootstrap itself and font and stuff and all that. That all happens in the package.json. It just pulls together all our dependencies, packages it all up together as we're going to develop. And that's the dev tools we mentioned briefly, briefly. Chrome is awesome to work with. Uh, there's this Augury um, uh, plugin for Chrome that allows you to browse the component tree and see all the routes. The routes are just the paths, what each path is going to end up calling. So you can browse down and see how the code is structured. You do have to make sure you're running in debug mode because um, there's a production mode for Angular which turns all this off so nobody else, once you're running production, you can go in and, and look at all your components and all that sort of stuff. You wouldn't want them to be able to perhaps dig through all of your code, or maybe you do, I don't know. But if you're running in debug or in, in development mode, then all of this stuff is available to your browser and allows you to be, be able to debug everything much easier. And you can also disable the server-side rendering um, while you're in development, which allows you to see the more real-time data and make sure that there's nothing being cached on the server side, um, just so you don't have to worry about the server side side of things. Uh, I mentioned these IDEs. Those are some of the ones that we have been using. Uh, there's a good resources area on the Angular IO website that has a big list of a ton of other IDEs and tools that we need to kind of sync up. We also have our own um, link off of our uh, wiki uh, in the resources that I linked at the beginning of this. Uh, that has some IDs that we've been playing with too, but um, these are the main ones that we use. And I'm not going to, this is, there's a ton of slides at the end that I'm not going through at this point in time because it's all hands on activities uh, that we did at open repositories. There, there's uh, options to be able to show you how can you create a feature collection and actually the steps you would go through and creating branches and how you create this component that's called a feature collection. And you could, um, uh, go through and add some data in here to pull data down, and it goes goes along here. And then there's actually uh, tags along the way, so you can see that step one, that whole create that component, is tagged within a GitHub repository where we store this. You can kind of walk through this at your own pace to be able to then uh, start at that tag. And then there's the next one where okay, now we're going to 
work with remote data. And so we have like a four stage step sort of tutorial process of walking through uh, doing some development with the DSpace Angular application. Uh, and we went through most of this. I'll say we didn't even get through all of this in four hours, which is why I'm not doing it here today at all. Um, but uh, but there's a lot of good materials there. And we wanted to keep this as up to date as possible. So if you want, if you start to play with this and you have questions, ask on Slack. Um, myself or Art or anybody else in the Angular team can kind of help you out in, in finding what the problem may have been if you were walking through and something didn't work right, right. But we're trying to make these as easy to learn and as easy to kind of jump into as possible. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and just stop there. I'm not going to step through these 40 some slides here of hands-on activity. And we'll end this with that. And I welcome any other questions either now or later. Um, and welcome your feedback as you start to look at the Angular application. And please get involved. <laughs> George? I just got a stupid question. Sure. Um, no question. So stupid. <laughs> now nowadays we we uh, we use Maven and then and then we do the uh, ant. Uh, so in this environment, how would we be doing the uh, compiling of the of the whole system? Good question. <laughs> um, we're still trying to figure out the best route for that. We're wanting to simplify the overall process. Currently, it's actually a separate. Uh, compilation. So if you, you go to the, the master code in DSpace GitHub repository, there's no user interface there right now. So we combine it, compile it via REST, or not REST, the Maven, and, and you'll just get the REST API, the current new REST API. Um, and then you have to, would have to build this separately for now uh, using Node and all of that. Okay. But as I mentioned, the Angular team is looking at ways to do compilation and some of that nature even via Java to cut Node out of the loop a little bit and see if we can do it via Java. If that would happen, we could probably just stuck it all into Maven if we wanted to, um, or we can look at other sort of tools. That's something that we're still kind of getting our mind around. The Angular team moves so quickly that we don't want to jump in one direction and be like, oh great, they just solved our problem for us a month later. So we're kind of, that's something where we're following along their, their work with the Java side of things to see if they have an easy deploy via Java and Maven. If they don't build that into place, then we're going to have to build our own sort of solution to make this all easily deployable as one thing. Um, I will note, though, because they are, because it is a REST API interaction, you, you will no longer need to deploy it all on the same server if you don't want to. You could have your REST API run on a totally separate server um, as your Angular app. And in fact, that's what our demo site is doing. Our demo site is hosted by Atmire um, in Amazon, I believe, if I'm correct. Uh, maybe Mark knows, maybe he doesn't. <laughs> and then, uh, and, our, uh, and the backend REST API is hosted by Four Science, which is, being, which is in Italy. Uh, so they're not even anywhere near each other remotely in the world, but, um, but when I demo the other sphere, it looks, you know, it's all seamless. So, but yes, that is to be answered, and we'll welcome your feedback as we start to get more um, further along and simplifying that build process. Probably time for one more question. One more question. Any other questions? Oh. This this seems great. Uh, is it ready? Can I start using this now? You can start to help us develop out <laughs> <laughs> As I mentioned in the talk yesterday, we have, we have a we're a pretty small team right now. So we have got only ten people. Nobody's working full time on it, but we've got a lot of um, a lot of collaboration going on, mainly through Atmire and For Science, our two major service providers. But there have been other groups involved at uh, Texas A&M, um, Technical University of Berlin, I think is the guy from Germany, and a couple other folks around the world who have been chipping in here and there. Um, you can you can use the browse interface immediately if you wanted to, but it's a basic browse functionality. There's not a whole lot there. Uh, we are constantly, as we're building things, we meet on a weekly basis, as I mentioned. Anybody's welcome to join our meetings. Uh, we would welcome people to just claim individual tickets. We're putting all of our tickets um, as clearly as possible out on uh, the GitHub repository. This same one right here, we create tickets there. Uh, as to the next step of what we're doing, we link it up with designs, if we have designs for it and all the other information, we welcome people to either grab a ticket or ask us what's an easy ticket to get started with, in which case we'll give you like a little bug fix or something to say, here, this is a problem, here's what we think would work, um, can you help us out here? Um, but we welcome people to get involved. We have our weekly touch base meeting, which you are not required to attend, but you're welcome to attend if you want to. And that's where we plan out the next week. We also uh, put all those notes out on the wiki and we keep in touch via Slack. 
And I feel like there was something else I was going to mention there. That might be the gist of it. I don't know. If there's other specific questions, we're, we're very open to, to finding new ways of working. If folks want to do things in a certain way, if you'd rather have more frequent meetings, I'm welcome to touch base with people more frequent. Less frequent, you don't have to show up all the time. Um, <laughs> anything like that works for us. Um, and like I mentioned, we, we would welcome uh, designers as well. If anybody has a UI designer, we're looking for some designers to help out. Oh, the other thing I remember that I wanted to mention, that demo site is constantly being updated. Every single time we do a code commit, it is now set up to automatically update that Angular demo site. So if you want to keep in touch with where we're at, go to the demo site as well. That's a great place where you can just start to play around. And as we get to the point of authentication authorization, we'll make sure that gets posted out publicly, how you can log in as like an admin and see you know, how the things are going on that demo site. Because that's an automated process right now that we're just pushing that stuff out as we're building. So that's another place. Yeah. Sorry, I went over time. Oh, yeah. well, thanks so much. <laughs> yeah, thanks.